The Oklahoma Sooners added a couple big body defensive tackles to the middle of their defensive line through the transfer portal. We'll talk about who and what it means for that position group on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners, and thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. Thank you for joining us. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. My buddy here is Josh Helmer. You can follow him on Twitter at Josh on Ref. You can also hear him Monday through Friday on 94.7 The Ref in Norman. And Josh had a couple defensive tackle commitments back-to-back days on Friday and Saturday. Surprisingly, you know, I figured we'd, we'd get the one and then the other one just kind of blew me out of the water a little bit. On Friday, Dejan Terry commits to the Oklahoma Sooners, the Tennessee transfer defensive tackle. And then on Saturday... Uh, Philip Paya, who had been playing the last couple of years at Utah State, also commits to the Oklahoma Sooners through the transfer portal. So we, we knew Oklahoma uh, based on the the offers that were out there or reported offers. Uh, transfer portal is always a, a little bit interesting in that respect. You're kind of waiting on uh, Dejon Terry to let us know that he's been offered by the University of Oklahoma or for Paya to let us know that he's on a visit or has been offered by Oklahoma. But uh, we, we had an inclination just based on sort of what the defensive line room looked like and particularly the interior of Oklahoma's defensive line that maybe they might want to add another body or two. And uh, now basically I guess the question becomes this with both Terry and Paya in the fold, John, do we know that much has changed with Oklahoma up front beyond just, Hey, they went and got a couple of depth pieces. I don't know if much has changed about the only thing that I think is significant is Dejon Terry. I think he could slot in as your starting nose tackle, you know, in three or four man fronts because he's got a lot of experience. He's played a lot of, you know, power five football at this point, And he's a productive space eater that you need in the middle of your defensive line, especially on early downs. Like you can throw him out there on first and second down against, especially against teams that are more, you know, uh, prone to running on early downs. And, and feel good about it. And if you want to be in a three-man alignment, then this is a dude that you can put out there, a 320-plus pound, six foot four, a big dude that's going to be able to eat double teams, keep your, your edge guys clean, keep your linebackers clean. So I do think that that makes a difference. You didn't really have this guy on your roster yet. Uh, you've got guys that you think could fill that role down the road, like an Ashton Sanders, uh, a Marcus Strong, but they're they're true freshmen this year, and they're not really physically going to be ready to do that. And so you've got a guy with four years of collegiate experience now. He, again, played in the SEC last year, had some production, or sorry, the last two years, had some production, and now you can put him in, in the middle of your defense and not have to to put people out of place. You know, that was, that was one of the the issues with the Alex Grinch defense a lot of times is you wanted to have a guy, a, a defensive tackle play the nose, but you're playing undersized guys there. You're playing a Neville Gallimore who was, I mean, he was a 290, 300 pound guy, but he would have been more, uh, more better utilized as a three tech. And, and the same could be said for a Perry on Winfrey or even a Jalen Redmond. These guys aren't your traditional nose tackle types. You get a guy out there that is a legit nose tackle type. And it really does, kind of open things up for how you de- how you deploy and play the rest of the guys on your defense. So I do think like this helps a guy like Isaiah Coe and a Jordan Kelly not have to play nose tackle, nose tackle, and be able to play more of that three technique where they're lining up between the guard and the tackle as opposed to right over the center and potentially have to face less double teams. The same could be said for your edge guys, Ronald Bothroyd, Ethan Downs, uh, you know, R. Mason Thomas, Reggie Grimes, any of those edge dudes, Desan McCullough, this helps everybody because you can't just ignore a 325 pound guy with some athleticism, a dude that's going to have the strength to be able to get out there and, and bully people into the backfield. You can't ignore that and just work your way to the second level and just assume all is going to be okay. No, you're going to have to account for this guy every single snap because of just his sheer size. You're not going to be able to run inside as easily. So I do think Dejon Terry does 
help in that way. And I, and I think he could be a significant role player in the, in 2023 with the Sooners defense, Philip Paya, I'm not so sure exactly where he fits into the rotation, but he's a guy that could play some nose tackle for you as well. Kind of interesting too, to just think about the big picture for Oklahoma here, N- not even just defensive tackles and defensive line, but the fact that I believe this is number nine out of the transfer portal for Oklahoma faces that they have brought in. And I, be- I do believe six of those are up front for Oklahoma. So, you know, big picture, there's been a lot of new faces that uh, Oklahoma has brought in. And then uh, obviously up front, there's a lot of new faces that Oklahoma has brought in. So now the question with these two here with Dejon Terry and Paya becomes, okay, one or both of these guys, did Oklahoma find e- even one impact guy right here? If it's like you said, sort of off the top, John, that you probably feel in, I'm probably right now putting words in your mouth a little bit, but you and I both maybe would agree that Dejon Terry's of the two who we feel more likely or more comfortable predicting will step in and be a contributor for Oklahoma. When you've got uh, for Paya, the stat line, two tackles, one interception last season, I'm not totally ready to sign off that you're about to come into Oklahoma and and be this absolute game changer, but we'll see on both. If one of the two, if one of these two guys here is a a difference maker and all of a sudden you pair that with co takes a step forward, Kelly takes a step forward, and then some of those other defensive line additions that Oklahoma's brought in, if it's Bothroyd, if it's Ford, if it's Downs and Stripling, whoever, right? Guys that were already here on campus, their progression mixed with a couple of these transfer portal hits, okay, Oklahoma might have something pretty good up front. I think it's fair to say that after the beginning of last year, John, through the Nebraska game, and then after that, once you got into Big 12 play, interior pressure wasn't altogether great, and really just pressure on a consistent basis for Oklahoma on the defensive line wasn't great for Oklahoma. So hopefully they've shored that up a little bit here, big picture. Well, and the run game was terrible for the most part. The run defense was not good in Big 12 play. You look at that Baylor game, and if they're even just a little bit better against the run against Baylor or even West Virginia, I think they win those games. They, they're they right there for the taking, but you couldn't stop Baylor's rushing attack and you couldn't stop Garrett Green in the second half. But you have a couple guys that can come in and, and be difference makers on the inside. And now difference makers for nose tackle, that looks a lot different than a difference maker for another defensive tackle or defensive end. These guys aren't going to rack up a lot of stats. They're just not because they're constantly taking on double teams and doing all the dirty work. But you got to have that guy that does the dirty work similar to your offensive linemen. Your offensive linemen aren't getting a lot of the glory for your your touchdowns and, you know, the the numbers of yards that you put up a lot of times. But they're doing all the dirty work so that all that can happen. A lot of times that's the case for a a nose tackle as well. You got to have that guy because he's going to help keep Danny Stutzman clean, help keep Jaron Cannon clean, Desan McCullough. Like having that availability and and ability to just, just take up space and not let the guard, you know, who's, you know, the guard center combo block and not letting those guys get to the second level clean. That makes a lot of, uh, it makes a big difference, especially for a defense like Brent Metables that wants to get downhill and wants to attack. If, you know, Dejon Terry and Philip Haya, they're holding up the guard and center. That just gives a guy like Jaron Canick, Desan McCullough, Danny Stutzman, a, a, a better ability to get downhill, fill gaps, and make plays and not have to worry about dealing with guards and centers all the time like like they've had to or that they had to last year. You know, the the defensive interior was a struggle for the Oklahoma Sooners. Now they've they've beefed that up. I mean, these are not the only two. They've also added Jacob Lacey and Davin Sears. Like they've really made a a strong emphasis this offseason on shoring up the interior of the defensive line. Now, who all ends up getting significant playing time out of that group, we'll see. But I really feel with the the six that they've brought or the four they brought in in the transfer portal, Kelly and co returning, uh, Grayson Halton as well, you know, stepping up into a, his sophomore season. Um, well, actually, I guess it's his red shirt freshman season. Uh, and then Derek LeBlanc is a true freshman. I really feel like you've got a really solid group of eight defensive interior defensive linemen that are going to allow you to kind of play matchups a little bit and, and be um not so like set in on, okay, well, we don't really have a nose tackle. Isaiah, you got to play the nose. 
Like you've got to, you've got guys that can play roles. And I think that matters a lot of times in a defense that, okay, De- Dejan, we're not asking you to go out there on third and 10 and rush the passer. No, you're going to be our first and second down guy. You're going to be our short yardage guy, our goal line guy. You're getting out there. Philip Pius, same thing for you. You're going to rotate in those roles. Whereas, you know, then you can save Jordan Kelly and you can save Isaiah Co for your pass rush situations where they were pretty effective in limited opportunities last year. So I think it does help to, to delineate the roles a little bit more cleaner or clearer for everybody so that they know what they're supposed to be doing and, and not having to play out of position as much. A bunch of uh, other recruiting notes we can pass along with you. So you've got a pair that you've added here in Dejon Terry and Paya, but uh, boy, that's just kind of the, the tip of the iceberg as the calendar turns into the month of June, which this has been historically, John, a, uh, a busy time on the calendar, not just for Oklahoma, but uh, you know, football programs in general, but certainly OU with the barbecue and a bunch of different things on the calendar with visits, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, offers getting doled out. This is a busy month historically for OU. And let's tell you a little bit more about that. But first, make a fast break on over to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs. All even one apiece. The NBA Finals. Miami, man, after round one, I didn't know that, that they had any of that uh, left in them for this NBA Finals. But sure enough, we're all even. Don't matter what happened in game one because game two was Miami's. Right now, new customers, a no-sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. The uh, FanDuel app, it's safe, it's secure, it's uh, super easy to use. They've got great promotions every day. And uh, the part that winners like, you get paid instantly. So there's no better place to bet on all the playoff action than over with America's number one sports book. FanDuel.com slash locked on a no sweat first bet up to $2,500 FanDuel.com slash locked on FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. I'm looking here. It was uh, as expected. The Brent Venables camp uh, this past weekend. It was a busy one. Uh, Six high school athletes netting scholarship offers from Oklahoma. Uh, one of the names that kind of caught my eye, John, that was sort of intriguing here, uh, Ivan Carrion, who, uh, by the way, is a Texas Tech commit, uh, 2024 four star, six foot six, 205. So looks the part, athletically is the part, blue chip kid. But here's somebody that's committed to Texas Tech. But guess what, John? You've got uh, which connection at play here for Oklahoma? The Emmett Jones connection. So Emmett Jones was his primary recruiter that led to that commitment for carry on. And now Emmett Jones is in Norman and the kid comes to camp, earns an offer. I think that bodes well for the Sooners. I mean, six foot six, like, okay, this is we're getting our Mike Evans type. Now, if you remember Mike Evans, Texas A&M about a decade ago, like all that dude has done in the NFL is gone on to have 8,000 yard season so far in his career. So like you're getting a dude with a lot of size, six foot six. I mean, you, you can't, you can't teach it. You can't teach size. It's, it's just the, the big difference maker. A lot of times when you're recruiting and, and you're analyzing prospects now, how that plays out at the collegiate level, we'll see. But I mean, in an offense that wants to be a little bit aggressive, gets the ball downfield, having a guy that you can just throw the ball up to, that makes a big difference. And I, I think it's interesting knowing like, okay, we've got Zion Kearney already committed. Oklahoma is trending still very positively towards Bryant Wesco, according to the people that I talked to. And then you have another one that they've offered that if the connection with Emmett Jones is real, I mean, he's a committed, a committed kid visiting Oklahoma for a, Brent Venables football camp. I don't know how many more tea leaves we need to read to think like, okay, this kid wants to come to be, play with Emmett Jones. I don't know, but it, it definitely is significant as far as that recruitment goes. Other names to, I guess, uh, put on the radar for Oklahoma in the offers sheet. You had Chase Lofton, who uh, again is a, uh, well, that's a fellow pass catcher, 2025 kid. Uh, you have an offensive line offer. We love uh, we love the big bodies up front, right? So like to see Coach B getting after it. Melissa, Texas, 2025 offensive lineman. Owen Hollenbeck was offered. Who else? Brock Boyd was offered by Oklahoma. And then uh, Evanson, Malaska, and Gregory Patrick, the uh, 
the sophomores, sophomores right now, 2026 kids uh, that uh, were offered by Oklahoma. So busy, busy weekend for Brent Venables and company. And this time of year, John, it just typifies that. You know, it's interesting. Like, I think what's fun about these offers is they earned these offers just based on their work here at camp. Now they've probably done some background and, and watched these kids play in their, in their high school thing. But I mean, it's the same way that, uh, you know, Keon Brown was able to earn his offer last year. You know, yes, his, his path to Oklahoma might have changed and things might go a little bit differently for him, but there's something to be said for a kid that goes out, you know, but kind of sight unseen or, you know, no promise of anything and just goes and performs and then earns an offer. Uh, there's something kind of neat about that and, and a little bit romantic almost about that as far as sports go. You know, if, if you ever tried out for a sport, I just remember going back when I was in high school baseball in my first semester in Texas after moving from California, you know, three weeks in it's baseball tryouts. And I remember how nervous I was for that and like how, cause it was so important because I grew up playing baseball in California I made all-star teams, but I was like, I'm at a new school. Nobody knows me. I got to go out and really perform. And I, you know, thankfully I did. I had a great tryout and, you know, made my mile time and did really great in the, the little scrimmage we had that week. And, and it worked out and I'm, and I made the team, but I just remember being like, you know, so nervous for that, you know, going out and performing in front of coaches I'd never met and, and having the opportunity to kind of show what I could do, but how satisfying it was to, to see my name on that list after all the final cutdowns, like that's just got to, I kind of feel like that's what they're feeling right now too. It's like you go out there with no promises of anything and you show what you can do in front of this coaching staff. And they say, yeah, we, we want you on our team. We're going to offer you a scholarship. Cause that's what that means. Like it's not a placeholder offer. It's like, we saw what you can do. Come play for us. And that's just got to be so cool, man. And that's one thing I like about this staff too, John, is they're not afraid to, regardless, and I know we've got a couple names here that, one that right off the top we're talking about that's committed to Texas Tech and four-star kid, obvious blue chipper, but this staff is not afraid to have somebody come to the Brent Venables camp, impress it said Brent Venables camp, and dole out an offer regardless of what 24-7 sports or on three or rivals or the ESPN recruiting page, they don't care what any of all of us or you yahoos out there have to say. They care about their evaluation and what their eyes tell them. And uh, I like that about this staff. The idea, I mean, you're talking about it's the romantic idea of going out and impressing a coaching staff. Well, that this coaching staff puts stock in that too, John. They do. And I, and I think that's that's something that's neat. And and, and while like we love the recruiting you know, analysts out there. I mean, Parker's our dude, Brian Smith, John Garcia. We love those guys. And Brandon, Josh, like all those guys do great, great work. And it, and it's important to, to, to read what they say and see what they're saying about how these recruiting battles are going. Cause they're definitely in the know at the, in addition to that, understand like the coach's evaluation is kind of the, the last thing that matters. So if they see a three-star kid that they really, really like in the 2025 class, like, who am I to say, oh, man, that's that's not a good kid. Like, that's not a good football player. No, like the three star. Yeah. OK, Georgia is showing us that the stars matter 100 percent. But at the same time, if you can hit on some of these kids that are under evaluated and under recruited, that that can make all the difference. A lot of times you got to have those glue guys that are your Drake stoops, you know, that are just going out there constantly making plays for you, even if they weren't a highly recruited prospect you know, in a particular cycle. So yeah, th these camps are, are huge for them. And, it, and it's a great way for Oklahoma to kick off its summer, because as we saw a year ago, the summer is the month is the time of the year when Oklahoma is really going to be making headway on the next recruiting class. They did it in the 2023 cycle in the 2022 summer, and they're going to do it again this summer for the 2024 cycle. It's just going to start rolling here over the next few weeks. They got a big visit coming up this next weekend with Williams Winery coming to town. And then the following weekend, it's the David Stone weekend at the Champion Barbecue. So like these next few weeks are going to be absolutely huge for the Sooners. But I mean, for all intents and purposes, like this is the time where they start seeing those commitments come through. And I, we may or may not see a, a Winery or a Stone commitment, but it would not surprise to see a lot of other commitments coming down over the next couple months. It's that time of the year. It's that portion of the calendar where 
typically Oklahoma makes its hay. So yeah, I would, I would think that, you know, not necessarily that it's one of those big, big names that we have on the board, whether it's a Winery or a stone, let's hope it is. That would be, that'd be great for Oklahoma. Uh, what a nice feeling that would be to leave the summer and head into the fall. And for both Winery and stone, you're talking about guys starting their final seasons. And Oh, by the way, they've gotten the uh, decision done. They've committed to the university of Oklahoma. Not sure that it's going to play out that way, but uh, just for OU, for for you, I, everybody in Sooner Nation, to feel comfortable, we need this thing to go on the similar path that it's gone. And I'm sure it will, John, but go on the similar path that it went a year ago where it's relatively quiet in terms of overall commits. And then all of a sudden we get through June, we get through July, we get through August into the start of football season. We look up and it's uh, finding a couple of final pieces to add to your signing class versus uh, trying to do all of your work late. Exactly right. And it's, it's going to start hitting over the next few weeks and, and we'll have all that uh, covered for you here on locked on sooner. So make sure you're subscribed to the show, wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, make it your first listen every single day. Josh got to turn our attention to softball. Cause what a weekend it's been so far for the Sooners in the women's college world series opened it up on Friday with a Friday. No, Thursday, sorry, on Thursday with a two nothing win over Stanford, an absolutely you know fantastic performance by both Jordy Ball and the Jerry Kennedy. It was absolutely you know it was a classic pitching duel that kind of reminded me of like Schilling versus Martinez, or I guess not Schilling because they were on the same team, but Pettit versus Martinez, or Pettit versus Schilling, or you know Pettit versus John Smoltz, like these classic pitchers duels that you'd see in the late '90s, early 2000s between b- between some of the giants of baseball back then. Um, but yeah, both absolutely fantastic. And then you know just again clutch hitting. All three hits that came for the Sooners in the fifth inning were with two strikes. You know the the Riley Boone and Elena Torres and uh, you know Jada Coleman coming through with the with the the game winning RBI and and knocking a, a pair in. Uh, getting the unearned run as well. So fantastic performance that on that front. And then beating Tennessee was even more impressive with what they did. I mean, the Jerry Kennedy is the best pitcher in softball, arguably. I mean, Jordy ball is right there too, but you know, she has the lowest ERA in all of college softball for a reason, but she's absolutely a really, really good player. And then to come back and see Jordy ball, you know, pitch three and two thirds, allow just one hit, one walk and, you know, have at one point retire. What was it? Eight, nine in a row. Uh, of the Tennessee Volunteers, the number two offense in the country, just a a special 10 and two-thirds innings for Jordy Ball in those first two games of the Women's College World Series. Absolutely. And to to set the stage for Oklahoma to just do what Oklahoma's offense is more than capable of doing, John, which is to run away and hide from a really, really good opponent. Tennessee is still playing for this national championship. Now they've got to turn around and and go beat Florida State twice on the other end of the semifinals, but they're capable of doing that because they're that good. Ultimately, I think it's probably going to wind up being Oklahoma, Florida State. That's just how how I think this thing's going to play out. But man, offensively for Oklahoma, what they did was very, very impressive against a very good Tennessee team for TRA to hit the big fly uh, early and then the the third inning where man once you get going with this Oklahoma offense I know we talk a lot about the pitching and deservedly so with Jordy Ball has been uh, magnificent and then just throughout the course of the season what Nicole May and Alex Taraco have both done as well and collectively and even in spots Kirsten Deal has shown that okay I, I'm going to be a force for the future for this program and yet the, the snowball downhill from TRA's big uh, three-run blast and then all of a sudden Kinsey Hansen goes yard. And guess who? It's Riley Boone again. I mean, it was one after another in that third inning, and all of a sudden you look up, John, and it's 9 to nothing, and Oklahoma's in the semifinals. Yeah, that Kinsey Hansen home run was crazy to me. Like, I felt like – I tweeted it out on the Locked On Sooners Twitter account, but it was like she had used a one-iron – off the tee and it just barely got up off the ground. Like it had, it had a really low launch angle. It was just a line drive that she just absolutely crushed uh, over the fence. I mean, just an incredible hit. I mean, we know Tiara, like she's going to do what Tiara does and she's fantastic. I, I'm, it's been fun to watch Kinsey Hansen's season play out the way it has as well, because she's just as good often 
but because of injuries, because of illnesses, she hasn't been able to play as much and, and she's been a little bit limited. Uh, but everything's just kind of coming together for her this year. Again, you know, after two years ago, having a 20 home run season, she's again, putting together a great season, but you mentioned Riley Boone and yeah, just a little spark plug at the back end of the order that helps set the table for the top of the lineup. And she does it at, at least every game. I feel like there once a game, she's getting on base in front of Coleman and Jennings and making something happen on the base paths. It's like you get, you know, the, the wheels started falling off for Tennessee, you know, with the, you know, Tara Jennings home run, the Kinsey Hansen home run. And then man, they, they really, really fell off because of the wild pitches and, you know, gifting Oklahoma a couple more runs um, on the, the misplay uh, where, where Riley Boone hits the triple and um, or, you know, hits it out to left, you know, left field and, and neither Kiki Malloy or the left fielder, no, nobody calls it. It's a, it's a miscommunication on the play. Probably the left fielder should have got that ball, but Oklahoma takes advantage and, and is able to score a couple more runs off that. And again, more two out hitting from this team. And it's just one of those things, just when you think, okay, they're down to their final strike, they're down to their last out, they're going to come through. And it, whether it's the end of the game or in the middle of the game, they are very good, you know, two strike, two out hitters. And yeah, they just keep coming at you. And the, the matchup with Stanford, it's going to be another good one. Uh, we'll see who they throw out there. They've got a couple really good pitchers, and it'll be interesting to see what, what Patty Gasso does. Will she go back to Jordy Ball? I think she can. You know, she only threw three and two-thirds on uh, on Saturday. So, you know, with a little bit of rest on Saturday, plus the whole Sunday, and, and plus a little bit of Monday, you might be able to go back to Jordy Ball, who had a great game against Stanford. And, and it's a lineup, Stanford, that, isn't as strong as Tennessee's lineup, you know, offensively they're, they're not as good. I mean, they're definitely a pitching and defensive team, but so if you, you can go out there with Jordy ball and I think still be super effective and, and have a chance to, to win and get into the women's college world series without having to go to one of those, you know, elimination games to in the semifinals. Elena Vodder, uh, nice pitcher as well for Stanford. Uh, probably, Every Sooner fan is familiar with Nigel Kennedy after what happened on Thursday and the way she, for a long, long period of time, held down those Oklahoma bats and then uh, obviously turned around and was was fabulous again versus Washington. So, you know, wins over Alabama and and Washington now to get back to this point versus Oklahoma. Nigel Kennedy, seven innings pitched, one hit, and uh, no earned runs, nine strikeouts versus Washington. Does – if necessary, does she have two games in her versus Oklahoma or probably more than likely, John? I'm guessing it's going to be Nigel Kennedy because why wouldn't it be uh, given how well she pitched on Thursday versus Oklahoma? But my fear for Stanford would be it's tough for a great pitcher to look like a great pitcher twice against OU. I, I just feel that Oklahoma is going to and did begin to solve Kennedy a little bit, even though nobody's really solved her. But we're going to see. We're going to see what happens. It's an amazing matchup because she's looked fabulous so far. And uh, Stanford obviously has another pretty good option in Vodder that they can go to if things get sideways early a little bit. Yeah, it's an Oklahoma lineup that's difficult to beat, you know, for seven innings. And, and that's what makes them so good is you can kind of keep them in check for a little bit, but eventually they're going to come through and, and they know that too. The Sooners play like they know eventually we're going to come through and we're going to, we're going to get the hit. So a big game on Monday. Uh, we'll talk about it on the live show Monday night, 9 PM central time here on the YouTube channel. So make sure you're tuned in for that. Subscribe to the show again, wherever you get your podcasts we're free and available on all platforms and on YouTube, hit that notification bell to let you know when new episodes drop, follow Josh on Twitter at Josh on ref, follow me on Twitter at John nine Williams, and then follow the show on Twitter at locked on Sooners as well. Until next time, he's Josh Helmer. I'm John Williams, boomer sooner.